On this Thursday night, Canada's spy chief sounds the alarm about foreign meddling. Foreign interference is therefore a complex and enduring threat to Canada's sovereignty. Why the Prime Minister is resisting calls for a public inquiry. A deadly avalanche near the Alberta-BC border. Be the saddest day ever. The victims all from Germany, leaving communities in two countries in mourning. Doctors without planetary borders. There's no Canadian jurisdiction in outer space. The rise of space tourism raising legal questions about aerospace medicine. Plus, ancient secrets unearthed. What's been hiding beneath the Great Pyramid of Giza? Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Opposition MPs are now officially calling on the federal government to launch a public inquiry into allegations of foreign interference. Together, they passed a non-binding motion tonight on the same day that Canada's spy chief was called to testify on Parliament Hill. CSIS director David Vignon described the Chinese Communist Party as the principal threat facing Canada's democratic institutions, specifically pointing to the activities of the CCP's overseas arm known as the United Front Work Department. The budget of the organization dedicated to engage uh, the, the uh, Chinese abroad, but also to interfere in, in other countries' internal affairs that done by the FWD, the budget of that organization now is bigger than their entire Department of Foreign Affairs. It gives you a sense of how important this is. This is why um, uh, the President of China, Xi Jinping, calls the UFWD one of its magic weapons. Today's testimony from top federal and security officials in the House of Commons shed light on some investigations into alleged interference, but it did nothing to quell the calls for a full inquiry. Mackenzie Gray has tonight's top story. The hunt is on inside CSIS to find who leaked highly classified allegations of Chinese foreign interference. And Canada's top spies suggested those whistleblowers were unsatisfied with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's handling of Beijing. Any uh, information that is disclosed uh, uh, in an unauthorized way, uh, is you do not know the consequences, you cannot foresee the consequences down the road, so I think it's, it's very serious. Through a combination of intelligence sources and CSIS documents, Global News first reported that the Chinese consulate in Toronto allegedly bust in Canadian Chinese seniors and Chinese international students to vote for current Liberal MP Han Dong during his 2019 nomination meeting in Don Valley North. Dong and the Liberal Party of Canada deny the allegations, but sources say CSIS warned senior Liberal Party of Canada staff about Dong. Today, David Vigneault would not comment on the allegations but did say he briefed the Prime Minister on interference more broadly. I have had uh, many opportunities to brief the Prime Minister, Cabinet and different ministers on the subject of national security, including specifically on foreign interference. That interference, Vigneault believes, disproportionately impacts Chinese diaspora. The threat does not come from the Chinese people, but rather from the Chinese Communist Party and the government of China. Indeed, we are keenly aware that Chinese communities are often the primary victims of PRC foreign interference efforts in Canada. One of those alleged Chinese interference efforts appears to be blunted. Does that mean that the operations from those illegally, uh, illegal uh, Beijing police stations have ceased? We are, our understanding is that they've ceased and we're continuing our investigation of the ongoing. Complaints of foreign interference have inundated the Commissioner of Canada elections recently. Carolyn Samar testifying her office received 174 complaints about foreign meddling in the 2019 and 2021 votes. Most of those complaints have been resolved, but Samar says a few are still open. That this review is ongoing as I speak to determine whether there's any tangible evidence of wrongdoing under the Canada Elections Act. NDP Conservative and Bloc members of the House Committee studying in foreign interference voted to ask the government to establish a public inquiry on the issue. The Liberals voted against the non-binding motion, but in the end, Jeff, the decision to call an inquiry is up to the Prime Minister. Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa. Thanks, Mac. And let's bring in our David Aiken now to unpack some of the political implications in all of this. So, David, help us understand why the Prime Minister is resisting calls for this full public inquiry. What's the downside? Well, Jeff, you know, the Prime Minister would argue he has not yet ruled out a public inquiry, but Liberals have been arguing that 
Multiple processes are already underway to tighten election security. The government is considering recommendations, for example, from the chief electoral officer. And there were some recommendations in that report earlier this week that talked about major interference or lack of it in the 2021, ele 2021 election. Now, finally, the prime minister's office pointed out that it doesn't seem to make much sense to have a public inquiry when the top secret stuff, that's the important stuff, cannot be made public. And in fact, that is a point that the director of CSIS made today. How can we find the best possible way of having classified information, you know, uh, part of, of, a, of a classified discussion, but uh, inform the proper debate without becoming public? Is that the key conundrum? A conundrum indeed. So Jeff, I'll answer your question by echoing a famous phrase of another Canadian prime minister. This PM believes an inquiry if necessary, but not necessarily an inquiry. Yes, I'll take former Prime Minister Mackenzie King for 500. Thanks, David. And the opposition parties, of course, as we've heard, all seem to agree that there should be a public inquiry, but they've disagreed over exactly what it should look like. So what were the sticking points? Yeah, so the original motion to have an inquiry came from the New Democrats and the NDP, and they wanted a pretty broad inquiry, but they definitely wanted the spotlight on liberals and conservatives. The conservatives do not want any part of the spotlight. They want the focus on China, the liberals, and Prime Minister Trudeau. Now, the director of CSIS, once again, he's got no opinion on the proposed inquiry, but he made the case that the issue of foreign interference is not limited to any one party, any one election, or even any one jurisdiction. The actors who are engaged in foreign interference against Canadians do so at all levels of government, at the federal, provincial, and municipal level, uh, and they're doing it across party lines. And it is that scope of the interference, Jeff, that makes it such an important issue. David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks, David. Turning to Western Canada now, and another deadly avalanche in British Columbia. Three skiers from Germany died in yesterday's slide, bringing the total number of people killed this season to 12. At least 10 heliskiers were caught up in the avalanche, southwest of Invermere, near Panorama Mountain Resort. That's about a three-hour drive from Calgary. Jamie Dahl reports. One by one, the choppers just keep on coming, landing at the Invermere Hospital as horrified neighbours watch on. Just sadness, just going, you know, this is tragic, Some, you know, this is, this is not a good scenario. I knew that there had, was something very wrong, you know, so I lit some candles and, you know, said some prayers. Ten people swept up in a Class 3 avalanche Wednesday while heli skiing outside of Panorama, B.C., Three skiers, all from the same village in Bavaria, Germany, died. The mayor of that town writing in a statement, all of us in our community are deeply shocked by this accident and we feel deep sorrow. I myself am shocked, stunned. I still cannot believe how cruel life can be. He's not the only one feeling that way. RK Haliski, the company involved, says it's devastated. Be the saddest day ever, not just in our lives, but Definitely here at, at RK for the tragedy that's taken place. Four others, including a guide, were injured but are expected to recover. Anytime one of your team members goes down, it's tragic. Again, this is the most difficult day of my life. An unstable snowpack this season has resulted in multiple deadly avalanches, prompting countless warnings. There's a layer uh, at the bottom of the snowpack that continues to be a concern for us and has continued to produce uh, large and destructive skier and rider triggered avalanches. Risk conditions were considerable at the time of the slide. RK says it has served 160,000 clients since 1970 and is committed to safety. This is what we are trained to do as guides, as an organization, as team members, as pilots. We go through thorough, thorough training. The company has asked Heli Canada to activate a critical incident stress management team to help them navigate this disaster, sending their support to the families who now have the overwhelming task of getting the bodies of their loved ones home. Jamie Dahl, Global News, near Invermere, British Columbia. 
Britain's spy agency is being blasted in a new report looking into the 2017 Manchester Arena bombing. An inquiry found national security and counterterrorism officials missed a significant opportunity to act on key information that might have prevented the suicide attack. A radicalized extremist detonated a homemade bomb at an Ariana Grande concert, killing 22 people, the youngest just eight. Forgiveness will never be an option for such evil intentions and those that played any part in the murder of our children will never ever get forgiveness. It was the deadliest terror plot on British soil since the 2005 London bombings. Crystal Gomancing reports on the inquiry's findings and lessons learned. Oh my God. In a matter of seconds, the lives of thousands were altered. There was a realistic possibility that actionable intelligence could have been obtained which might have led to action preventing the attack. Actionable intelligence by UK counterterrorism and national security officials on this man, Salman Abidi. Abidi detonated a bomb in the Manchester Arena in May of 2017. He killed 22 people and injured more than 200. In his final report, the inquiry chair concluded the attacker's family had extremist views and were involved in the, quote, struggles in Libya. Authorities knew of Abidi, yet did not question him when he returned from Libya. He was not followed, nor did they recommend him to prevent a UK de-radicalization program. As a result of these failures, at the very least, a real possibility of preventing this attack was lost. This is a devastating conclusion for us. The majority of evidence and the recommendations to the security service is sealed because of national security. MI5 did make a statement on the few details made public. Had we managed to seize the slim chance we had, those impacted might not have experienced such appalling loss and trauma. I am profoundly sorry that MI5 did not prevent the attack. Forgiveness, however, is not possible, says Liam Curry's mother. From top to bottom, MI5 to the associates of the attacker, we will always believe that you all played a part in the murder of our children. Parliament has been tasked with ensuring the secret recommendations to the security sector are implemented. The mayor of Manchester says it is now beholden on all public bodies to use the findings to ensure that all communities are better prepared to protect people. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. The U.S. Secretary of State confronted his Russian counterpart today, demanding Moscow end its war in Ukraine. Antony Blinken and Sergei Lavrov met for a brief private meeting on the sidelines of the G20 summit in India. It's the first face-to-face -face meeting between a U.S. cabinet member and a top Russian official since the start of the full-scale invasion. But Blinken says Russia isn't budging. President Putin, however, has demonstrated zero interest in engaging, saying there's nothing to even talk about unless and until Ukraine accepts, and I quote, the new territorial realities while doubling down on his brutalization of Ukraine. Meanwhile, Ukrainian soldiers are fighting an intense Russian attack on the eastern front line. Residents near Bakhmut are fleeing their homes as Russia closes in. Kyiv says enemy forces are now storming the city. Bakhmut is considered a key gateway to the strategic Donbass region. To Greece now, where violent protests erupted in response to that horrific train crash that killed dozens of people Tuesday night. <laughs> protests broke out in multiple Greek cities late Wednesday, many demanding answers, blaming the government and the train operator for the tragedy. Two trains collided head-on at high speed. They've been traveling on the same track for several kilometers. At least 57 people are now confirmed dead. A station manager has been charged with multiple offenses, including manslaughter and negligence. Another American retailer is closing its doors in Canada. Coming up, why Nordstrom is shutting down.
California has declared a state of emergency in 13 counties, including L.A., as it digs out from rare, extreme winter storms. Some areas have been buried in more than three meters of snow over the past week. Officials say it could take 10 days to clear mountainside communities. Another severe storm could hit this weekend. And staying with the U.S., a Pennsylvania man who booked a flight to Florida has been arrested after authorities say an explosive device was found inside his checked luggage. Mark Muffley now faces federal charges for allegedly trying to bring explosives, fuses, and a lighter on board an aircraft. Police say he fled the airport before he was arrested. And a dozen charges have also been laid after a major explosion that rocked an Ottawa suburb and injured 12 people last month. Cody Troy Crosby faces multiple counts of arson, breaking and entering, and criminal negligence causing bodily harm. That blast destroyed four homes under construction. It was initially blamed on a gas leak. Finding health care in the cosmos. Next, the legalities around medical treatment in space. Nordstrom is shutting down all 13 of its Canadian stores and cutting 2,500 jobs. The Seattle-based retailer says all Nordstrom and Nordstrom Rack locations will close by late June. Its e-commerce business is ending today. Sales and profits sank for the holiday quarter, and the company says it doesn't think it will ever be profitable. Nordstrom opened its first Canadian store in Calgary in 2014. Canada Soccer says it has reached an agreement in principle with the women's national team on compensation for last year. The details are still to be finalized, but the deal would be similar to the one for the men's team and would include pre-game incentives and result-based compensation. The sports governing body called it a step forward in its ongoing labour dispute with both teams. Space tourism is poised to take off in the coming years as private companies embark on sending paying customers to the stars. And researchers are now exploring how doctors should operate in the final frontier. As Catherine Ward reports, advances in aerospace medicine could have implications for health care here on Earth. My name is McCoy. I'm a doctor. Medical support for space flight is a key part of any mission. Both times I was in space, as the physician crew medical officer, I treated my colleagues. Most of the time, things run according to plan. Uh, Houston, we have a problem. But there is always risk. What level of care do we need to be able to provide on orbit if something unforeseen happens, if an emergency happens and somebody's ill or injured? That question even more important as the space tourism industry becomes more mainstream. We've gone beyond the regulatory framework of the international partners, the government agencies that made up the International Space Station program, and all the protocols, the standards of care, the training requirements. Medical licenses are tied to geography. Once a physician is licensed to practice in Canada, then they practice in that province with patients in that province. For Canadian physicians who actually want to practice in space, they basically would also have to find a way to legally practice in that jurisdictional boundary, which is space. And as flights open up to more people, there is an interesting legal predicament. Under international law, outer space has no jurisdiction. So there's no Canadian jurisdiction in outer space. Outer space belongs to all. More flexibility for medical licensing could be part of the solution. Can have a license that can be portable, that can be used, for example, at any launch facility in the world with respect to any spaceflight participants over whom they're supposed to oversee. With experts noting that approach could also help right here at home. But there's no question there's a subset of physicians where we would benefit significantly in our ability to deliver virtual clinical care, primarily to patients in northern Canada, if we were able to get a license in more than one province. More than one province and perhaps more than one galaxy. Catherine Ward, Global News, Earth. Up next, ancient discovery, the first glimpse of a secret chamber inside one of the seven wonders of the world. Welcome back. Now to an astonishing discovery out of Egypt, where for the very first time, archaeologists were able to peer inside a secret chamber hidden in the Great Pyramid of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the world. Until 2015, no one even knew the chamber existed. Mike Armstrong explains how they found it. 
As imposing as it is in terms of size, the Great Pyramid is as impressive in terms of secrets. It was built as a tomb, a monument to the reign of Pharaoh Khufu around 2560 BC. Well, 4,500 years later, it's still making news. We are in front of a major important discovery. Now, what experts have been able to do for the first time is look inside a void in the pyramid. It's an open space discovered several years ago, but only with scans and radiography. They knew it was there, but couldn't see it until this moment. This is the endoscope, right? This is the camera of the endoscope. Crews found a way to slide a wire with a camera at the end, basically between blocks. It was only six millimeters wide and made it right into the void. There had been speculation the room was a corridor, but now knowing what it looks like, some experts say it may be something else. If we say that this tunnel is protecting or is holding a stones above something, we cannot say it's a corridor at all. There is no way. Now the chamber is the shape of a hallway, narrow and long, about nine meters from end to end, but it doesn't seem to go anywhere. There is a shaft about seven meters below it, so could there be something in between? There is a theory this void may actually have been built as an open space to take weight off something below, possibly another still undiscovered chamber. Between the seven meters and, and the tunnel that we found today, there is something important in my opinion. This project brought together experts from around the world, including Laval University in Quebec City. It also brought together some of the newest technology available. And while it all helps answer some questions, it's also leading to new ones. Mike Armstrong, Global News. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Jeff Semple. In tonight's Your Canada, we pay tribute to singer-songwriter Joni Mitchell. She still got it. Mitchell joined a group performance last night in Washington, D.C. The 79-year-old was honored with the Library of Congress Gershwin Prize for popular song. She's the first Canadian and the only the third woman to receive the accolade. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you back here again tomorrow. Have a great night. We have to on the camera.